Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. After Kun Chris announced, I think there's a crowd over there, and there's a big crowd in this auditorium as well. It's quite unusual. But it's our pride also to introduce, even everyone knows, everyone is here for the authors. So, Kun Chris, Dr. Chris Baker, and Dr. Pasuk Pong Pai Jit, they receive the award Fukuoka, which is uh, very rare for the Thai to receive, and it's the first couple who receive this prize as well. So the book, A History of a UTR, is really uh, helping the Thai and the others to understand better, like the other books that they already wrote, and it being used as a, a book for university reference. So, congratulations. And I would like you to meet Dr. Chris now, Ka. Thank you to the President, Kun Pi Kun Gao, and thank you for all of you for having come tonight. I don't think we have seen an audience like this for quite a long time. <clears throat> When the, this, this is a book that is written by the two of us, by me and Pastor, like most of our projects, they are joint. But I'm going to present it tonight, uh, mainly to save time, because it's quite a long lecture and I can go faster on my own. <laughs> I'll get away with that. When the, uh, and what I'm going to do t today is to, is to summarize some of the main arguments of, of the book. But first I want to say, when the Europeans first came to Asia in the 15th, late 15th and the 16th century, they said there are three great powers in Asia, India, China, and Ayutthaya Siam. But if you look at the history now, uh, the way it's been written, Siam has nowhere near that kind of salience. We think we can rightly claim that this book is the first academic English language history of the full 400 years of the Ayutthaya era. There have been many other great books on Ayutthaya. One of them was here, but it's disappeared. Um, especially Ajahn Chanwit's book, The Rise of Ayutthaya, but it deals just with the first part, and it's now 40 years old. There's only one really serious Thai language history of Ayutthaya that covers the whole period. It's 30 years old. So it's about time, I think, that we should have another one. This, uh, this thing, as I say, I'm going to some of the main, summarize some of the main arguments of the book. And since we're covering 400 plus years and I've got 45 odd minutes, I'm going at about 10 years a minute. So that means I'm quite high above the surface of the planet and I'm going a little bit fast. I'm going to do it by dividing the era into periods. And they're you know, roughly, in terms of the dates are kind of rough, they're not exact or anything like that. But more importantly, they're thematic periods. They have very different themes. The first one is about the, mainly about the sea and the maritime origins of early Ayutthaya. Second one is about an age of warfare, which goes on for almost 200 years. And the third is this era of peace and prosperity that begins around 1600. And the last one is about the, the, the lead down to the fall of Ayutthaya in 1767, but seeing it not so much as a period of decline, but a period of turmoil and rather positive change in that era. I'm, when I'm talking about Ayutthaya, I'm talking... Hold on, where's my little gadget? Yes, okay. We're talking about the Siam in this era. Siam in this era is basically the flat, the flat bit, the, the white bit on here, the flat bit of the Chaupia plain, roughly equivalent to the central plain to, today. It develops also... No, that's the wrong thing I'm pressing, right. It develops also some spurs out to the, the Mon coast to the west, and up to Korat on the east, and some power down the, down the peninsula. But it's basically, Siam at this period means the central plain of Thailand. OK, let's start with rising from the sea. This is a story that is completely absent from any record in Thai. 
It's absolutely not seen at all. It comes from Chinese records, Malay records, Arab records, and from some of the early Portuguese records. And whenever you pick up uh, a, a book about Ayutthaya, many of them start off by giving you two facts. They say it was founded in 1351, and it's at the junction of the Pasak and the Chalpia rivers. They're both wrong. Both of these facts are wrong. If you look, if you go back to this era, you had, this is the central part of the, of, the, of the central plains. Now it doesn't work. Okay. And the rivers come, it's a very gently sloping plain. The rivers come very gently down it. And when, whenever they hit a piece of slightly higher ground, they, oh, here we are, they, they will make a, a curve. And Ayutthaya is on a slightly higher curve, a higher bit of ground like that. And probably, and so this is the Chalpia going down there, the Lopri in the middle, and the Pasak. So probably early Ayuti was formed by making a, <coughs> a canal, probably where what Klong uh, Padojin is at the present, to make it into a moated settlement. And it probably had uh, a relic stupa at the centre, which would be on the site of uh, Wat Mahatar, because certain stones have been found under there, which suggest they're from an older period. The, 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 the bringing of the water from the Daupia and the Pasak River come much later. So there's Ayutthaya and there's the river going, Lotbury River going around it and probably closed, something like that. There's been a, people arguing that the old city was off here to, to the east. And that's because there's a couple of pre Ayutthaya what there, particularly what some. And also if you look down in this corner, you can see things that might look like Khmer Barai. But it's much more likely it was like this, because this is the pattern of all the previous towns in this area, Utong and the Konpotong and so on. And what, uh, wh why do we know that it's not just founded in 1351? In the Chinese records from 1282 to 3, a Chinese officer, a general of some sort, flees to a place called Xi'an or Xi'an. Now, later, that is the term that is used for Ayutthaya in the Chinese records. Some historians argue that actually, in this period, the Chinese didn't know very much about Xi'an, so they just used this term Xi'an for different places. So this, this might have been Supanburi, it might have been Sukhotra, or anything else. I don't think so. I think it meant, I think it meant the site of Ayutthaya from the very beginning. And it was already clearly an important place because it sent a mission to China, to the Chinese imperial court in 1292, and the Chinese demanded that they send another one quickly afterwards. It was not a, a minor place already. And most importantly, too, in 1324 to 5, this wonderful big Buddha, which is now in Wat Pananchung, off to the southeast of Ayutthaya, was built, was created as a great big uh, freestanding Buddha out in the open air, similar to the Pali Lai image at Supandri, which had been there before, but bigger and grander. It must have been the most spectacular uh, uh, image of that time. Also, we know from Sukhothai records that monks visited a place in 1344 which they called Ayotia Si Ram Tepnakorn, the holy city of King Rama. So it's already named after the great god king of the Indian Ramayana. It's already got uh, quite a, uh, a aspirations about itself as a city. And we haven't yet got to 1351. What happens in 1351, we don't really know. What is really striking is in this first 150 or 200, almost 200 years, from the 1280s to the 1480s, is that Ayutthaya sends fleets southwards, down the peninsula to Temasek, Singapore, across into Sumatra, raiding. And they're raiding for people, for gold, and probably other kinds of resources as well. And we know this because the people there keep complaining to the Chinese court. They complain, uh, so, so from 1295, the Chinese forbid Xi'an from doing this kind of thing, and of course they take no notice. And l later on in the 1340s, you have these descriptions saying these are Ayutthaya people, they, get, they send fleets, fleets south with injunctions, and they're very aggressive, and they take things away. Right? So, and 
They're not only raiding and taking away resources, they're developing trade, becoming the dominant traders down the peninsula too. We don't know what in, what products, until the, the Portuguese arrive in the 16th century. And then we can see that Siam is exporting foods like rice and fish, but also metals you know, and ivory. And it's bringing in people, slaves, and various other things, particularly stuff that's come from China, carpets and brocades. Also in this period, and very importantly, it develops to become the single most important trading partner of China. And of course this is hugely important because China is the great manufacturer of this period, making much more sophisticated uh, goods than any, anywhere else. And it's also a huge market. To, um, and the Chinese imperial court is operating the tribute system so that the uh, ruler it gets legitimacy from sending tribute missions there. And Ayutthaya sends more tribute missions than any other single, single place in this period. It's sending mainly exotic forest goods, particularly aromatic woods, but also bird feathers, animals, and textiles, and other things. And back, it's importing mainly uh, manufactures, fabrics, porcelains, medicines, and other things, a lot of which it then exports further to the west. And it's greatly favored by China. So for instance, here we see in 1377, the Chinese emperor sends a missive which says, in terms of present day Fan, sort of barbarian kings, it can be said that you are worthy and virtuous. And it sends marks of favor too, like the, the, the dragon robes, a set of official weights, and it sends representatives to attend the funerals of Ayutthaya kings. And when Ayutthaya ships get wrecked or robbed in China, also they get considerable assistance. It's a, it's a very significant partner in trade to China at this era. What's it like? We don't have much description. The first one comes from Ma Wan, who was the, uh, the scribe on the Chenghe uh, voyages in the 1420s. And he says, it's already very cosmopolitan. There's lots of Chinese living there already, and lots of foreigners, which we don't know. And then he uses this wonderful line, the customs of the people are noisy and licentious. So we're getting the picture, you know, it's a port, you know, after all, it's basically a trade, trading port. But then he also says something which is much more interesting. He says it's the custom that all the affairs are managed by their wives. They all follow the decisions of their wives because the mental capacity of the wives certainly exceeds that of the men. Now, this is a statement that is repeated by every new visitor to Ayutthaya all the way through to John Baring in the middle of the 19th century. They all said the same thing. The women do all the work, the women are clever and so on. Uh, it's nice and it's fun and it always gets a laugh, but it's also very significant in this. It tells us this is basically a commercial society, it's a trading society. Once you have an agrarian society and the strength of the man becomes important, men dominate women. But as long as it's basically built on trade, women can dominate men. And this continues in Siam all the way through to the 19th century when you start getting, it starts to turn into an agrarian society. He also describes the king, and this is also very interesting. He says his house is elegant, neat, and clean. He describes his, his, what he wears, which is not much different from everybody else. And he goes around with one elephant, with one, uh, one attendant, with one umbrella made out of leaves. To get you, you have to read the rest of this scribe's uh, uh, writings on other places to realize this is very modest. He goes to other places and there are big palaces. There's lots of gold. The king goes in big processions. So this is very modest. Again, it's more like the head of a commercial town than it's a grand kind of king at this period. And we see, get the same sort of impression when we then go across to the, th the Thai language records. And the Luang Pasert Chronicle, which is the oldest chronicle, considered the most reliable. What does it tell us about Utong, Ramatipadi the one, the first, the founder of Ayutthaya? It tells us only one thing, the year that he died. He doesn't tell us anything else about him at all. You know? And if you, if you go then into other things about legends about Utong. There's at least, least, five, at least seven different versions of who he is. He might be a Thai prince coming from the north. He might be a Chinese prince who, who came from the sea, a Khmer noble from Angkor, a local guy, or a Soli, which might mean a Chola from India. 
Now, we can't decide, it's not impossible to decide which, if any, of these are true. And if you then go on also to look at the early records, look at the history of the first, of the first couple of hundred years, and particularly the chronology of the kings, it's a mess. You know, different versions say different things. That the chronology of the kings doesn't compare between the royal chronicles and the Watt chronicles, and neither of them match what the Chinese keep, and the Chinese kept their records good, very well indeed. What does this, but what it tells me is, is this is that this was basically a port at this time. This is Hamburg, not Berlin. It's Liverpool, not London. It's, it's a very rowdy port. And there aren't sort of grand kings as we think of them uh, from a later period. The business of, they didn't care about chronicles and chronology and all this kind of thing at this point. That all came much later, and hence it's rather confused and it's in multiple kind of versions. Okay. Now, <clears throat> as trading towns which are near the coast always have an impetus to stretch their power in land in order to control their sources of supply. And in our case, this means particularly the areas up here, the, the forest areas uh, up towards Lana, which is where a lot of the forest goods came from. And this story is told in the existing histories about Ayutthaya very quickly, in other words, within 30 or 40 years after the 1351 foundation, conquering Sukhothai, conquering, 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 and sacking Angkor. These are the words that are used. This is, this is if, if you read the records quickly, this is, this is not the way really it, it happens. Uh, the, the newer sto story which comes out is sees a much more of a merger between these, dif these different areas, which has some fighting, yes, but it also has some much more interesting peaceful processes going on. And particularly, what it has is a merger between the ruling families of these areas. So on one hand, you have the Sukhothai family, which is the ruling family from the old Sukhothai kingdom, the, the, the successors of Ramkamhe. And you have the Supanbari family, which becomes the dominant ruling family in Ayutthaya. And they exchange marriage partners over several generations. You know, they exchange queens. And of course, when a queen traveled from Ayutthaya to Pitsanulok or the other way to become a queen, she didn't go on her own. She went with her nobles. She went with her, her, her slaves and, her, and her, her, her attendants of one. She went with soldiers to look after her. And she went with monks. She would have gone with a big entourage. So what you're getting in this process is an exchange of population. And what we also find very interesting in this is the development of twin towns. Because sometimes when these, these, uh, these white queens were sent, there were also towns built for them to, 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 to live in. And the most interesting one can be seen at Kampeng Pe, because there the river's coming down here. And what you have down here on this side, which is now called Nakon Chun, is a very Thai town. It's exactly very similar to Sukhothai. It, it's, it's watered. It, there's hills up here, and there's streams that run down here, and it takes water out of these streams to grow its crops and to have its water supply. On the other side of the river, up here, which is where the walled city of Gumpeng Pet now is, is a new town which was built sometime probably in the late 14th or early 15th century. And this is like the towns which you find in, in the Khmer and in the flatlands of the, of the Jaupia Plain as well, where you, they take the water for their supplies out of the river. They take it out of here, and they lead it in here, and they store it in tanks here, which is a kind of Mon Khmer style of doing. So here they are, these, these two kind of cultures here, uh, separated now by just the, the space of a river. And there's an interesting law from this period that shows there's exchange between them. You have exactly the same thing as this at Pichit and at Pizzanulo as well. And what also you probably get in this period too is migration from the northern cities down to Ay Ayutthaya. Because Ayutthaya was getting rich from trade, it was an attractive place to go. And also, probably, it's a period of very dry weather for about a century. And it probably affected the Sukhothai area, Pitsanulok area, much more than it affected Ayutthaya. So there may have been migration on grounds of you know, want of food as well. And so what you see through this period is the adoption at Ayutthaya of customs and practices that were already known before from Sukhothai. 
from art styles, administrative systems, storytelling, writing of poetry, things which we already know were happening further north, start to appear in Ayutthaya at this period. And the merger is perhaps most simply uh, seen in, in the art styles. Because if you look at, well, it's well known that the early Ayutthaya Buddha fig figures, things that are called Utong style generally, are like this. They're very ro robust bodies, very square faces, right? Whereas Sukhothai, you know, very oval faces and very languorous, almost androgynous bodies. What you first, and these two are still separate all the way through until about uh, 1400, 1500, when this, this, is, this is, comes from Hiram Woodward's work, he, he thinks this is the first sign of the two, being, the two styles being merged together. And you see it even more strongly in the Sihing Buddha, which becomes the dominant uh, style in Ayutthaya. You look at this face, imagine just putting those two together by you know, sort of computer mute, fusing them, you'd get something very similar to that. So you, it's rather than this old history of conquest, there's a history of fusion between these different areas that goes through this time. And you can also see this in language. Right? Um, the Thai language, as known today, and which develops in this era, has enormous input of Khmer. In fact, one, uh, one student of language said, basically, it, Thai is 40% Khmer. Yeah? And this is not just loan words this, is, this has come in. It's how you create a polysyllabic word. It's how you cre create, put words together in, in a sentence and so on. It's in the structure of the language that has, that has changed. And in the same fashion, Khmer is very different from other languages in the Mon Khmer family because it has been affected by, it has been affected by, by Thai. So this obviously came about by, with the speakers of these two languages, and there's an element of mon in there as well, living closely side by side over quite a long, over a long period. And the early studies of DNA uh, are showing much the same. They're showing actually that Thai and Khmer, as, as of today, are closer DNA than Thai and other people in the Thai language groups, and Khmer and other people in the mon Khmer language groups. So there's a real fusion that goes on in this era. Okay, so that's the first period, which takes us through to the early uh, 15th century. And then there's a, a rather momentous change which happens around this era. Up until this time, I don't think there's been much in the wet way of real warring. If you look at the, the, the records in the chronicles of wars, it's more like raids. You know, you go and raid another city in order to take away people, to take away its Buddha images, to take away tribute. You're not trying to impose any kind of control. All the stuff that's been used in the writing of Thai history, which talks about vassalage and all things like taken from European history, forget it. This idea of taking territorial control was really not uh, important in this era. But something happens in the 1430s and 1440s. Ayutthaya sends armies out much further afield than before. It sends them west across to the Mon coastline, sends north all the way up to Chiang Mai, and it does send at this time armies across to Angkor. They don't sack, but they do take things away from there. And from then on, the, the, sort of, the trend of warfare rises until pretty soon afterwards, there's a campaign just about every two years. This is a real age of warfare, and it's a terrible time to have been alive. Okay? And it's critical to this, guns become important later on, but critical at the beginning is elephants. Okay? And, for, and if you read the Sukhothai records, they, they, when they fight duels, and so, the kings and nobles are on elephants, but you don't get the impression that there are many elephants around, there are rather few. And in the, the elephants reported at Ayutthaya, around 1500, they say there were 500, okay? And 1551, 50 years later, 10,000. Now, I think the, the increase is like that, but it's a little bit earlier. And there's intense hunting of elephants at this time, descriptions of hunts with 30,000 men. On, on the hunt. And why you find so many white elephants at this time is simply statistical probability. It's just because you're hunting so much, then you, you find more of the white varieties. Why are the elephants so important? Three reasons. First is they carry heavy gear. 
uh, and therefore they extend the range of the armies much farther than was possible before. Second, they raise the king and the nobles above the fray. As long as you're fighting with hacking at one another with pieces of metal, you know, as you can see in this, in this, uh, this picture, you only have to be you know, a couple of a couple of meters above the fray to be in a much safer position than if you're down on the ground. And the third reason is they're absolutely terrifying in the charge, especially if they're in must, or if not in must, they primed them by getting them to drink gallons and gallons of liquor before the battle. So in, in this description, this poem, Yuan Pai, the de defeat of Lana, which we have translated, which describes an army going to battle in 1474 to 5 and was probably written very soon afterwards. It describes the elephant brigade with having a thousand mounts there and 60 of them are described. They're described with a name which is usually in the Pali, sacred Pali language or in Khmer and then a little description of how wonderful, either how good they look, how brave they are in battle, so on. Like the king's own mount, it's so high that it makes a king look as if he is going to as if he is flying. And then this one, Pontrezet, like a portrait drawn, he is so beautiful. In the same poem, only three humans are named, compared to 60 elephants. And not one of them gets an ounce of praise in the same way. That gives you some idea of how important these elephants are. And this wonderful line, some so superb surpass a city's worth. You know, they're so important to the warfare at this time. And as I said earlier, the warfare is not so much about territory as about getting resources, about gaining people, pretty women, and so on. And this is explicit. It's not just theorizing afterwards. Because it says in the, in the Chronicles, naturally, in any kingdom, having beautiful women, white elephants, jewel mines and gold mines, you're going to have a war. Because other people are going to want to come after these. Okay? And we see in the descriptions of the armies, for instance, after the first Burmese attack of, sack of Ayutthaya in 1569, a European watched the army came, come home, and he describes them, you know, laden with gold, silver, and jewels, and with noble men and noble women that were taken prisoners there. And it's not only the nobles who benefit, it's also the ordinary grunt soldier. They come back carrying gold, or just clothes, or tables and chairs, and all kinds of other things. So, and so, in the end of the poem I just described, Yu and Pai, it celebrates the, this victory in such the same way. It celebrates the loot, the, the ladies, the women that they took, weapons, gold, children, and elephants. And these would have been given to the king. But further down, the ordinary grunt, again, he sees silver and gold, and marvelously, we tie up prisoners, drag them round by horse. When tired, they're sold away or swapped for booze. Real, sol real sol soldier stuff. So, uh, armed warfare, participating in warfare there, became the way which you rise in the social scale. It's the way you make economically progress, and it's also the way you get greater status. This is true for nobles, but it's also true for ordinary people. And this is reflected in the palace law which at this time, where it sets out a range of incentives for people who go to war. So if you go to ride a horse into battle uh, and you take a head, you'll get a golden bowl or something. But look at the last one. An ordinary soldier who takes a lord, which probably means an officer or a noble from the other side, you get good gold, good silver, appointment to govern a city and a royally presented wife. You go from near the bottom of the social scale to almost at the top. Right? And of course, for this, how did you prove this? You picked up the heads. Right? So we have several descriptions in here. That to go back from the author, you, picked up, you had to take up the heads and take them back home. What we're seeing here is the militarization of a society, a military eth ethos, uh, a rather sort of cruel and rather nasty ethos in this society. The armies grow to be enormous because there's not much technology at the beginning except you know, lots of people and very crude weapons. So the way you won was by having bigger armies. In the records, the numbers in these armies are greatly exaggerated by the European reports. But the critical thing is people who came from Europe and had seen fighting in Europe thought the armies here were simply enormous by, compa by comparison. 
So while this incentivization, which we saw in the palace law, worked at the beginning, after a time, you had to have mass recruitment. And the first sign we see of this as creating registers of people and mass recruitment is in 1518. But it may have begun before that. We can't really tell. And it's significant, I think, also, too, that this poem is the only war epic in, written in Thai, which has survived, uh, which uh, before the 19th century. This was the period when warfare is at its height, and it produces this kind of thing. And even then, if you look at the love poetry of this era, Lilit Pralor is the great love poem of this era, in the invocation at the beginning, the invocation usually talks about you know, how wonderful the gods are, how wonderful the city is, and how wonderful the king is. Instead, it's, it's, it's boasting about how many people Ayutthaya killed in the most recent war. Uh, and when you get to the ending, and it's a love story, it's a kind of Romeo and Juliet love story, and what happens at the end is the hero and two heroines get peppered with poisoned, poisoned arrows. And lovely, they, their blood flows down in floods. They lean upon each other, still erect, appearing like a work of art, which, of course, Thai artists have responded to by drawing it. But after that, their four servants are, 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 are felled in the same way beside them. After that, the death squad, which did this, are all arrested and slashed like banana plants. And finally, the dowager who caused the whole thing is flayed and dragged behind an elephant. So in a space of, actually, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's a huge, long 4,000-line poem. But this all happens in the last sort of 200 lines. The stage is littered with more bodies than the whole Shakespearean historical plays put together. So this is very, it's a very nasty kind of ethos in this society. You see it also in the, 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 the public culture, the, in the round, the annual round of ceremonial. The biggest one is not a religious ceremony, and not even a royal ceremony, so much. it's the military parade, which takes two days and is displays of all kinds of fighting, including uh, bullock carriage flight, sheep fight, bald-headed people fight, and so on. Okay? And this, this, this trend of, of warfare becomes worse with the coming of gunpowder. And that starts with Chinese and some Turkish uh, guns, which are basically tube guns in, in the late 1400s, then cannon, Portuguese cannon in the 1510s, and then arquebuses. Arquebuses are these, you know, the matchlock rifles, basically, which are very, the most important ones. And the other sort of technology that comes, and there's a sort of arms race at this period, is mercenaries. Because there's, with the growth of trade, as a market develops for mercenaries, which include people coming from Europe, Portuguese particularly, and Greek, but also from all over the Indonesian archipelago and locked down the, the east coast of Africa as well. And these are professional soldiers, so they fight nasty in a way that ordinary recruits from the peasantry or the local people don't. And as a result of this, the death rate goes up enormously. So we start in the Chronicles to get reports at the end of battles of large numbers of deaths. And deaths don't only come from uh, killing on the field of battle, but also from dragging these enormous armies across the landscape, which spreads famine and epidemic disease. Uh, it's usually reckoned even in modern w warfare, you have about three people die for every one on, on the battlefield. At this period, this was even more. So this trend of warfare goes up and up and up till sort of late in the 16th century, and then it, turn, it starts to turn down, and it turns down for two or three different reasons. The first is the defensive technology gets better. The cities, cities go out and they build how do we get much better walls. This would be much higher than it looks here because there's about two meters of sort of silt filled in here on, on the walls of, of, of Ayutthaya. Um, but they also, uh, it's better defensive technology, but there's also resistance. One of the best shows of this comes in Burma, in Pegu, when there's a massive slave revolt against recruitment in the army. We don't get that, we, no sign of that sort of revolt in Siam. Instead, what we get is draft dodging on a massive scale. People flee into the forest, or they bribe the recruiters, or they go into the robe. 
So uh, over this latter part of this, cent of this century, later 1500s, you see the size of the armies enormously declined. Some battles, only you know, three or 4,000 people involved, as small as that. And of course, once, uh, once the, uh, the, the, you're not being successful, once you're not being successful in campaigns, then warfare is no longer performing this social role of providing wealth and, and status. So it starts to decline away. And the end of this uh, period, this end of this terrible period comes around 1600 and particularly is symbolized, I think, with the death of King Nerysuen in 1605. This may be myth, but it's a wonderfully symbolic story. He dies while on campaign trying to take the Burmese capital. He dies, he dies of, of, of disease. He swears his brother that he must continue the campaign, capture the Burmese capital, and then enter the city with Nari Suan's corpse strapped to the head of the elephant. What the brother does is swears, yes, yes, brother, I will do that. As soon as he dies, he turns around and he goes home. <laughs> and he doesn't, in his 10 years he then rules, I don't think he takes an, an army out at all. And in the next 150 years, the level of warfare goes right down. And I think this is a great story. I think it's a great story of you know, resisting this trend of, of warfare and, and bringing it to an end in, in, in one way or another. And the result of this is that the energies of this society, which have been put into warfare for almost 200 years, are now transferred into making money. And it releases a period of great uh, peace and prosperity through the 17th century. Okay, third period. Uh, there's been an argument around for some time, put up by Tony Reid, that this was a great age of commerce that was really prompted by the Europeans coming into Asia with the spice trade and so on, and considerably upping the, the overall uh, velocity of trade. But this isn't so important for Siam, because Siam produced almost no spices at all, just a little bit of pepper. Siam is slightly important for the Europeans in the country trade. That means you traded around Asia in order to make some profit, which you then invested in, in spices, which you sent back to Europe, and you cashed the deal at that end. But only slightly important for the Dutch. It wasn't so much. Ayutthaya is minor importance for the Europeans, and Europe is of minor importance, really, to Ayutthaya. Where the great wealth of Ayutthaya comes in the 17th century is from Asia. Because it's a period when you have five great empires across Asia, from Tokugawa, Japan, Ming, and then Qing, uh, China, Mughal, India, Safavid, Persia, and the Ottoman Turkey. And these all produce high quality luxury goods, porc porcelains, carpets, gems, you know, jewelry, all kinds of other things. They want to exchange it. They don't want to go through the Straits of Malacca because as today it's full of pirates, but also because it's full of the Dutch, which are just as bad. And this means that this, this portage route across the top of the peninsula becomes enormously important for Asian, Asian traders. It's very dangerous, it's a very nasty journey, it takes several days, but it's still preferable, for, for, particularly for high quality goods, to go by this route rather than through the Straits of Malacca. And Ayutthaya becomes a great center of exchange. And that seems a little bit strange because it's a long way up a river. You know, you're taking a week dragging your ship up, up, this, up this river. But in fact, that's what makes it such a good, safe mart. If you look at the histories of places like Songkhla and Patani on the coast in this period, they're sacked by pirates and burnt to the ground regularly, almost once every 10 or 20 years. Ayutthaya never suffers like that. Also, on the open sea, with the Europeans coming in with great bigger ships, they bully the Asian traders in the same way. But they can't bully them in the Jaupia River because your, 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 your ship with sails, once you're in a river with bad winds, you're extremely vulnerable. The only, the only European sh ship that's tries it is dealt with very quickly. You can't have gunboat diplomacy until you have steam power. Okay? So this makes Ayuti a very important exchange, place of exchange for all these high-value goods because it's a safe place of exchange. And hence it becomes this uh, very cosmopolitan city, these famous maps. This is one which is in the society's uh, collection which has you know, Chinese, Malays, Portuguese, Mon, and so on, all around it. 
And then, from a little bit later, you have wonderful descriptions of a number of different... This was a, a Sing Singhalese who, who came a little bit later in the 18th century. Just walking down one street, he described the number of different people he saw. It's a bit like walking along the skywalk past Ratprasong today. How many different languages do you hear? It's very, very similar, if you like. Okay. Um, and the city grows enormously in size. It spills off its banks. Into, and the Europeans who come are just dazzled. The dazzle. Van Nijenrode, who's a, a Dutch trader, he says, surpasses any place in the Indies for all the kinds of goods you can get there. Van Fleet, who was one of the best writers, in, it's the country that has more than most countries of everything that a human being needs. And it's also reflected in local poetry. There's a, in the, the lovely poem, probably written around the 1680s, it begins by saying, this city is excellent. It has everything, the world's finest, built by Lord Rama himself. The main beneficiary of this enormous wealth is the monarchy, is the king, because they become the principal merchant. And if you think about it, that's what I'm saying right back at the beginning, that, that was the case. And you only have to look at investment in SET today to see there's some constants in Thai history. So the king had He's sending five or six junks to China, two or three to Japan, one or three to Tonkin, etc., etc. He's an enormous, you know, it's a real trading company. On top of that, he put, there are royal monopolies on export goods. In other words, any other traders had to buy these goods from the royal ware warehouse and pay an enormous markup. On top of that, Narai also became a retailer. He was importing cloth and he had shops. He had shops in the markets. And he put a monopoly also on the beetle leaf, which everybody, uh, everybody ate, chewed, and plus taxes on, on the internal trade routes. And our good friend Nyan Road, the Nyan Road, made an attempt in the 1620s to estimate what the royal income might have been. And he thought it was roughly 25 tons of gold, of which probably 10 tons of gold was surplus. So it's a very high figure. And the, a lot of this was stored in the royal treasury, and, the, and the, the main royal treasury is here. And it's just outside the back door. This is the back of the main uh, audience hall. This is the bit where the king probably lived. So it's just a few steps outside the back door. And in this period, there's a, a, in the palace, Ayutthaya, many other treasuries had to be built because of the overflow. And on the tours that they gave to some of the visiting Europeans, they took them to see these warehouses. So Gervais, was, was, they're amazed. They said, it's eight or ten warehouses piled with unimaginable wealth, great lumps of gold dust. And Count Forbin, who was Forbin, who's a French soldier who hated Sia, you know, and, and poured scorn on almost everything. This was the only thing that really impressed him. He said, all the riches of the royal treasure, which are truly worthy of a great king and enough to make in love with the court, this hoard of gold and silver and precious stones of enormous value. And a lot of this enormous wealth was invested in glorifying the kingship above what it had been before. This is a plan of the palace, and the original palace just occupied the area probably of what, is what became what Sisan Pet. And a bit later, Trilokana built something a lot bigger. But Pasat Tong, King Pasat Tong in the 1630s, he doubled the size and he enclosed the whole thing in a single wall, creating this sort of shell-like thing. And it's part of a mystif whole mystif hiding and mystification of the monarchy. I'll talk a, a bit later. And he built these glorious uh, buildings too. Uh, this is one of the made audience halls. The ones before this period were almost certainly all in wood and have, have disappeared. But this, these, in this period, this comes up. This is the, the scale model in, in Mumbaran, in, in, in the ancient city. They are marvelous uh, creations. Um, and what the kings could also do was hire foreigners from everywhere for whatever they wanted. They hired them as their traders. They hired them as their technicians. They hired them as their guards and soldiers. And they hired them as their administrators. And of course, we all know about the, the story about Constantine Falcon and, and Narai in the 1680s. But actually, that's in, if you look at it from the point of view of Ayutthaya, 
uh, rather than from France. This is the end of a, a, a long period of similar figures in Siam. And, uh, and Falcon is probably much less important than some of the others. From, from around 1600, Chinese become important. There's an interlude with some Arabs. And then the 1620s, with Yamada Nagamasa, there's the Japanese. But most of important of all, from the 1630s to the 1670s, is the Persians, the Indo-Persians, Persian administrators who have come through Mughal India into Siam. And they have an enormous effect on Siam in this era. They have words that go into the language, dress, architecture, food. They're keeping sheep uh, in, in Ayutthaya and growing grapes. Uh, and particularly on art and design as well. So we know that Narai wore dress that was uh, copied from Persian court, court styles, and this was then uh, repeated throughout the, the, the Siamese court. We know that buildings took on these arches which come directly out of Indo-Persian architecture. This is the Envoy's house at, at Lotbury, and the, this, arch, this arch windows, and also this water is also part of Persian design. It spreads uh, everywhere. And most strikingly also, you get it coming into design elements, so particularly this famous tree of life design, which is, no, blimey, how does this thing work? What, what is lovely about it is, and, and, and this on the left, this is in Wat Chumpon, which is beside the Basak River, uh, up the Basak River. And it's a lovely little Wat. And this wall behind the Buddha image has this tree of life design, teeming with animals and flowers and trees and so on, which have no place in, 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 in Siam at all. And this is on a lovely cabinet. And what's nice is here, again, you have this all this stuff, this very foreign stuff, and as you come down here, it fades into a tiger knock. You know? So it's taken, this, this, this cultural influence is taken right into the culture, it's not separated and put outside. What, another thing that uh, King Prasat Tong does is a sort of Khmer revivalism at this period. He may have come from a Khmer family, or at least to have claimed to have roots that go back to Angkor. He started using Brahmins at court in a much bigger way than anywhere else before. He mystified the monarchy by you know, building, closing up his palace like this, forbidding people to look at the monarch, having the nobles stare at the floor during audience, have nobody look at the grand processions and targeting the eyes of people who dared to look at them. So there's this whole period of mystifying and, and hiding the monarchy. He also sent people to Angkor and they came back and they built this one thing, which he called after Angkor, Nakhon Luang, but doesn't look anything like Angkor, but also what Chai Watanaram, which clearly is in, inspired with its, with its symmetry, its galleries, and, and many other aspects of it, and very beautiful. And what also, of course, this, this great wealth went into enormous display, particularly in the Narai era. And it's lovely, the reaction to, to this, the Republican Dutch were rather turned off. They said this reverence which we see for the Siamese king is more befitting for a god than a king. But the royalist French loved it. They said in the Indies, there is no state that is more monarchical than Siam. The cost of this was significant. The cost is that all power is in the monarchy and, and uh, uh, that su success in this success in this society comes to depend very much upon royal patronage from the top. Therefore, the control of the throne is critical, and therefore, every succession becomes a fight. And here you see it. Battle, coup here means that literally it was just a, a usurpation that succeeded. Battle meant that they fought, and they went on 40, fighting sometimes for two or three years. And this was not just within the royal, the royal family and their cohorts. Because what happened was that nobles and these different foreigner groups up lined up behind the candidates for the succession uh, and fought. And they usually started with pitched battles in the city, uh, with inside the palace, sometimes spilling out into the city, often several rounds. And after it was ended, you'd have a massive purge. Okay? And, this, and sometimes aftershocks of, of provincial revolts. So we, at the end of this period, no one seems to know who's written this. This is a memoir written sometime in the 18th century. And it's a noble looking back. And he said, my God, it's been terrible. Look, you know, every time uh, in the Songtan 
reign, the previous kings uh, were killed. In the Pasongtai reign, the nobles elders were killed. Da -da 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 -da, were killed. Da -da -da -da, were killed. He goes on and on and on. Think, in 90 years, there have been seven killings, almost one every 13 years. And those who survived, nobles were demoted to being the ordinary pry, and other people were raised, raised up. So th this, it shows that not only that was this a, a rather not a particularly good way to run your government, as it were, but also that there's a lot of uh, objection to it, resistance to this uh, within the nobility, uh, which uh, is suffering under this particular system. Okay, last period, turmoil and change from 1688. In the old uh, analysis of Ayutthaya, this last period is a time of decline towards the fall in 1767. So Ayutthaya becomes isolated, the economy goes into decline, this Banplu Luang dynasty that comes in is a disaster, and internal division leads the way to the sack of the city in 1767. The newer version, and this is not for me, this has been done by Thai historians over the last 20 years, is that, no, actually, it's enormous dynamic trade with China after uh, 1688. No, the economy grows, in fact, becomes more open. If you, hadn't, if you count the years, Ban Plu Luang dynasty lasted longer than any other dynasty in the Ayutthaya era, and it's a time of great prosperity and creativity. So no isolation. <clears throat> Even though the British and French are chucked out after the uh, explosion of 1688, they really weren't that important at all, and had no, they didn't really have a, a long-term effect. The rising trade with China brings prosperity particularly after 1720, when southern China, southeastern China, is suffering from persistent famine. And the Thai uh, kings very cleverly point out to, to the Chinese that Thai rice is extremely cheap and they ought to buy it. This, so it becomes a very big article of trade. There's less royal monopoly in this era, so more people participate in this economy. You get new men appearing. You get this category of primangni, which means basically rich commoners, appears in, in the records. And certainly the population of the city of Ayutthaya significantly expanded in this era. <clears throat> but what comes with this prosperity is a great cultural uh, explosion too. You, uh, literature starts with particularly import of all kinds of stories from all over the world, the Thousand and One Nights, the Inau Tales from Java, uh, vampire tales from Sanskrit all come in to court culture, but also things like Kunchan Kumpen, a great folk epic, is, appears in this era as well. You also get dance and drama, particularly the, you know, the Korn, the mass drama, which is so well known. But it's not, again, it's not only the court. This is, this is a, a, a folk Korn. This is being performed at a temple festival. You know, with, uh, it's the same sort of idea as mass drama, but it's much cruder and dancing as well. And this is a time when you get, uh, the, I think this is when you get the, the germination of what murals starts in the late 17th century and greatly expands in the 18th century. And that's very interesting because there's a couple of aspects of these mural painting which I think is very interesting. The first is the way it celebrates the city. So though this is telling the, the story of, of the Buddha, this is part of the early history of the Buddha, what you get, obviously, is this fabulous representation of, of a, a, a Siamese city with the, the gates and the roofs and the gables and the towers and everything else. This is a celebration of one's own look, environment around what they're living in. And also at this period, this is very difficult to see, but it's wonderful, they get depiction of ordinary life on the walls. This comes from Peppery, and it's, it's right up high, and it's very difficult to photograph. You take the color out, you can, you can get a little bit more. So you have, it's a whole social conspectus here. There's people here that look maybe like slaves. Uh, there's people, down here. here she is, a vendor on the river and someone else here. And here's a noble being carried on a palanquin. And it goes on like this. It's a whole, you know, a whole kind of social landscape is drawn here. And, and this appears in other things. You get paintings of, you know, traders making their way through the, the undergrowth, you get uh, liquor salesmen and so on. And the other aspect of this painting which is interesting is its bawdiness. 
And this is something that continues all the way through to the Victorian era. So if you look at this from what Chong Nong see, if you look up here, you see, you get some very exciting things going here, some legs in the window here. And, uh, and what's noticing is the neighbors have all gathered around <laughs> to watch and to listen. And down here, down here, there's a man with his testicles hanging out, okay? And a young boy is just about to hook them. But here, this, we're in the middle of a Jataka tale. This is, this is the Vidura, this is the Vidura Jataka, one of the great ten Jataka. This is the Bodhisat, who is just about to grab on this tail of this horse and be hoisted up into the heavens. They're just a few inches apart. And you find this also in the poetry as well. This wonderful poem which celebrates how wonderful the temples are in Ayutthaya. In the next line it says, it's also a great place for flirting in the evenings. So, I mean, some people say this is there because of a contrast between the profane and the sacred. Hmm, I'm not sure. I think it's celebrating the sheer energy uh, and intimacy of this city in, in, its real, in, its, in its great high point of this. What comes also, though, is with prosperity and change is other things. The, the, the whole labor control system starts to decline. It's a long, slow decline. It declines particularly because when you start growing rice for China, there's, there's something new to do. You can go out there and grow rice, uh, and you can escape from the bonds of, 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 of labor bondage. A lot of crime and banditry, a few revolts, and most interestingly, corruption. And as, as always, corruption happens when new money is being made and new money is being used to try and change the system. And most interestingly of all, you get position buying. You know, the police today, and nothing new at all, okay? There are people who have paid bribes to officials to dismiss good men and appoint them in their place. They then oppress, bully, and cheat their pride and other people to make money to recoup the bribe. Okay? So this is a society which is undergoing very basic social change at this period. At the same time, also what you get at such times is people saying, oh, it's all gone to pot, everything is terrible, it's not the way things work. So you get several of, of these kind of, of documents with people moaning about the way things are. The state has two very interesting attempts to kind of deal with this period of, of disorder. One is much greater use of law. Right? So there's a, we've had written law since early, it's very important, since early Ayutthaya, but in this period you get a huge outpouring of legislation, particularly about labor systems, crime, and corruption. Perhaps even more important is, is this attempt to mobilize Buddhism as a way to discipline and control society. Uh, so, and this means there's an attempt to kind of shift the way Buddhism is practiced away from just making merit like you do today, you know, just put money in the, t in, in, in the donation box, but instead to having living a good life. You know, so living a good life so you can be a socially responsible citizen. And the part of this expansion of what murals is that the kind of uh, visual classroom with the Jataka tales and the life of the Buddha giving examples of how to live a good life. It's also by the nobility trying to mobilize Buddhism to, to if you like, discipline the monarchy too, to reform and discipline the monarchy too. So this, this code of the ten virtues of kingship, which have been around for a long time, becomes very prominent in the documents of this day, trying to make the king into a good king. And while that is one is still around today, there's also another one which is very, another code which is very important, the four principles of harmony, the Sangha Hawatu, which is saying that what a good king should do is promote agriculture, employ good officials, spend revenue on public projects, and speak nicely. Interestingly, this one has disappeared, while the other one hasn't. And the king who responds to this pressure uh, best of all is King Boromogot in the 1730s to 1750s. So a massive investment in building and restoring what? Which completely transforms the, the skyline and much of what still remains would have been from him. Uh, a lot of passing of laws which are an attempt to constrain other people also to live a, a moral life. And as a result, in the, the, the histories that are written at the time, kind of contemporary histories, he's celebrated as a bodhisattva, as a Buddha-to-be, as a man traveling through this world, uh, bringing good to the people on the way to becoming a Buddha in the future. And although his official name is Bodhamagot, in these 
histories written at the time, they call him Mahatamaracha, the great king of Dhamma, the old uh, title of the Sukhothai king. However, however, the city still fell 250 years ago on 7th of April, 1767. And there's nothing, uh, it's, the, 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 the warfare has not advanced very much. It's very much the same as what I said earlier. The, the Burmese army that comes is like a, a joint stock corporation of 40 to 44 uh, nobles who pool their, uh, pool their resources in order to attack Ayutthaya in, order, in the, hope of, in the hope, of, hope of gain. And the point is that by becoming so rich, so glorious, so grand, Ayutthaya has become a much bigger prize. And it's much, you know, much more vulnerable to be taken. So they combine their resources. And because it's so much bigger, it, it justifies the investment in a much bigger campaign than before. So here, approximately half a million men. Maybe slightly exaggerated, but still, it's clearly a much bigger army than had been seen for many, many years. And also a campaign that lasted for two years. And that's critical because of how Ayutthaya defended itself. It had built great walls. And it had invested enormously in guns. You don't have to read this, but this is just what the Burmese found when they broke open the armory. It was an enormous amount of, 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 of uh, artillery. But that would keep enemies away for a few months. And at the end of that, you relied upon the annual flood to send them back home. But the Burmese invested uh, in persuading their soldiers and nobles to come for two years. So when the flood came, they just went and, they went and camped in all of the, 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 the what around Ayutthaya. And they stayed there until the next campaigning season, by which time they basically warmed the city down by siege. And as before, it's a looting expedition. So they strip everything. They take away elephants and horses, gold, silver, bolts, barges, princes, princesses. Anything that could be moved and carried is taken away. And the same, again, look at the number of skilled people that are taken away, the different types of them. This is what, yeah, this is what warfare is still very much about. And again, it's also for the ordinary people who are taking away, uh, particularly uh, people to be their uh, retainers when they go back home. This is not new. What was new was this, that they said, after we've taken all this away, we will destroy everything that we can't take with us. So in the Burmese, this Burmese poem, which celebrates the fall of Ayutthaya, compares, it compares the site to the period at the end of a, a Buddhist era when seven suns rise and incinerate the world. So in other words, it just burnt everything down. And this was new. And this was because it seems that the Burmese had set out to destroy Ayutthaya as a rival capital, which has a lot to do with the politics of the modern country, which I cannot go into. But this was new, this was new. So, tailpiece, let me go back to the beginning. Let me go back to this fact that this really was this glorious and, and very important uh, place and very important power center for 400 years or more. Uh, but yet, it doesn't, really doesn't figure so much. It has been rather badly dealt with in the history. I think there's a couple of reasons for this. Right? The first lies in the national history national nationalist history of Thailand, which decided in the early 1900s that Sukhothai was, the, you know, was this wonderful place. It was the dawn of happiness. It was a kind of golden age, all full of Thai values and, and all these sorts of things, and the first capital of the Thai. And as a result, in the histories written from then onwards, Ayutthaya had to be a decline from this high point. And it declined, it said, because there was this Khmer influences, all these bad ideas like God kings and slavery came in. And also because of the Burmese who kept sacking the city. So in other words, the decline is blamed on the neighbors, which is a pretty simple thing to do. Okay? But this, this, has been, uh, this has been corrected very much over the last 15 to 20 years, particularly by Ajahn Chanwik Pasetsu in 1999 said, uh, you know, Sukhothai was kind of important, but not really. It's a very short-lived kingdom, maybe 50 years. It had some very nice sculpture and so on, but actually politically it's not that important. And it's also a slave society. He didn't say this, but it is actually a slave society run by warriors, but you know, rather than this glorious. But it, so this has been 
somewhat corrected, but it's not really got into the mainstream history, which still rather uh, uh, clings to this old theory. But also in the way Southeast Asian history has been written internationally, starting after the Second World War. It was initially written from the post-colonial capitals. So the Brits were writing about Malaysia and Singapore, the French about Vietnam, the Dutch about Indonesia. And of course, in, in this, Siam had no colonial patron. It didn't really until the Americans came in the 1960s. And then we have David Wyatt, but it's quite late by, by that period. But it's not only just because of the patronage aspect. It's also because this early Southeast Asian history is very much about the interaction between West and East, the penetration of the East by the West, and therefore most famously about Christians and spices. But Buddhism was so strong that they had no chance of you know, gaining much conversion in Siam. And as we said before, there was no spices. So it has not really figured in this history. So I think it's, you know, it's time, if you like, for a, a post-nationalist history of, of Ayutthaya. And also it's one that reflects that Ayutthaya is very much of an Asian story in history. It's all about influences coming from China and Japan, of trade networks that go China, Japan, to Persia, India and Arabia, to Persia, India and Arabia, and about relations with the neighbors, with the Khmer, uh, with the Burmese, and with the people of the archipelago. So it's part of an Asian history, which I think is about time that it came into its own. Thank you. Very kind. <laughs> he's, he's the historian. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> A any questions? <laughs> I'll try and do it quickly. Uh, the, the, the first uh, draft of this book was actually written a long time ago. It was written in uh, two th about 2002. And at that time, there was almost no Buddhism in it at all. But now there's a lot. And it's one of the things I've learned an awful lot about. And it's very, very important in the story in two or three different ways. It, it, in this early period, you know, in the period sort of up to Sukhothai, it, it's difficult to, to, to get much handle on what is the importance of Buddhism. But I think in the period of what we think of as the Sukhothai era and the period of, uh, of early Ayutthaya, it's enormously important. I think up to that point, 
uh, it's a rather crude society, and you can see it particularly in uh, Sukhothai, which is all about these, you know, like the Ram Kamheng description, you know, I, I slaughtered this man and I slaughtered that man, right? And then Lethai description, he's going to the market and he's, he's freeing slaves being sold in, in the market. I mean, it's a rather crude sort of society. But what comes there with this, with the coming of the, the, this new Lankan, we, we sort of, this is the Lankan uh, Buddhism, with monks going to Sri Lanka, coming back through Burma, and in the Konsi Tamarat and up. And then you get this extraordinary stuff in, in this what, what, what chronicles of this period. More in Sukhothai and Lana. It's not much from Ayutthaya, but obviously the same sort of thing happens. The, of a, people, this enormous enthusiasm for this new, uh, this new code, if you like. Mass uh, reordinations of monks, great building of, uh, of what? And you can see they become bigger because they're clearly, uh, they're clearly incorporating more people. You, you have to guess what's happening, but this, I, I think there is a sense in which this, this new morality that's come in this, uh, this Bud with Lankan Buddhism is part, it's, it's, it's fuel for getting this rather crude society under control. And you see this most wonderfully uh, in the description of the Litai era, with particularly Sisata, when he describes, you know, how he, he'd been, he'd been, you know, he'd been a thug when he was a kid, and then when his son died, he had this, you know, break, and he wanted to, you know, become basically the Buddha, you know, and, and it's a wonderful story of, of personal conversion, and there are several others at that time. So, I think this, at this point, it's an enormous effect. The other, uh, there's two other things. There's one is the bit I described at the end uh, with Boromagot, which has an enormous effect then on what happens in Ratanakostin, on Rama I and what, what he does. But more in the middle, um, there's a bit which I hugely enjoyed writing about when the Europeans went there and, and uh, were trying to describe Buddhism in the 17th century. Remember, these are mostly clerics, so they're mostly Jesuits or, or they're Catholics and so on. So when they arrive, they're bent on saying that they, they think Buddhism is basically idol worship, which they've seen in Africa. So they're, they're being nasty of it. You know, they say, oh, it's rubbish, absolutely rubbish. But after a bit, they suddenly realize you have these, this extraordinary uh, um, um, uh, institution of, of, of the monkhood, which has developed. And we don't really know how. But uh, what the phrase that we have used is this thick interface between, between you know, the what and the people, which comes by having this monkhood, which is, you know, as it were, open to all, and large numbers of people pass through it, but also daily interaction through the arms round and regular interaction through patronage. It's very, very much dependent upon patronage. So it's an absolutely central uh, institution to the society. So the intelligent observers which come in this, they, they describe, you know, how this institution is not only, it's not only just, uh, you know, be, being its sort of religious heart, it's d doing the education, you know, it's, it, and it, it's also providing them with magical services, all kinds of other things. It's an immensely strong institution at this time. Dr. Becker? Yes, please. I, I just want to thank you for the opportunity that you gave us tonight to have a first uh, insight of your work. And um, it's, uh, for me as ambassador of Portugal, it's very interesting to be here tonight and to listen to you. We discussed your work before and uh, it is, I just want to thank you in the name of all of us here present tonight. It's very interesting and congratulations for you too for this very very interesting work and the new perspective that you give to the you gave to the history of Ayutthaya and this important period for the history of Siam and Thailand. Thank you very much. Thank you. No, I, at the moment there's very little DNA research, very little. I, I, I think it, when it comes, and it will come, as, as it becomes cheaper, it's still quite expensive to do. I, yeah, I think it will be very interesting. Right. I, I
think one of the things it will show is just how many immigrants from India there are in the, in the Thai population, particularly the central Thai population. Um, I noticed in reading the Van Vliet uh, Chronicles, or whatever you'd call them, that the king at that time drank a lot. Uh, I wonder how much do you see that in the literature that you read? The use of drugs and alcohol. Those of drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's little bits of mentions of opium, but really not very much. And I think it's, I'm not sure whether it's Chinese con con confined. But yes, they, 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 there was a lot of uh, production of what they call wine. Um, really not know what, what they were producing. Um, they certainly p p the planted uh, a grape garden in the palace. There's the, the, the Suan Ang Mun, the one corner of the, the palace. So we don't seem to know very much about that at all. And they, the court used wine very much as a gift uh, here. Uh, there's an awful lot of pottery and porcelain, which is basically liquor containers. Yes, I think they drank a lot. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Probably very little, Kim. I, 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 I you know, um, and I, I, I sort of hope that. Um, that I, I, know, I know that some of the Thai historians who've already read this are quite excited by it, so that's nice. But how far this will go, who knows? Mm. So, uh, do you think you can get this into Not immediately. But we will, we have already started putting it into Thai. Okay? But this, this takes a long time. It, it's, we've, experimented before with having professional translators and it doesn't work. You spend more time correcting it. So it's much better to do it yourself and that means passive doing it. So. I, can, I can't translate. I can edit it after she's translated. I can't translate. So it's, but it, it, the, the history of Thailand, it took us 10 years. So, but I think we'll try and do this one quicker. Whenever there's, a, whenever there's an administrative restructuring um, after each king's passing, um, there's, you even mentioned that there, um, the provinces would also sometimes yeah. get uppity. Yeah. So usually how long did it t would it take to put them back in line? You, you, can't, you can't generalize because the information is on this sort of thing is very bitty. You know? So it's in the, the way the chronicles were written is... It's very different from rain to rain. You know? So sometimes uh, the people who were writing it were interested in this kind of stuff, so they wrote it down. And other rains, none of this stuff appears before, but and it, it's just interested in other, other things. So, for instance, in the, the Prasat, Tong Chronicle, uh, it, the, the, the Brahmins have clearly got hold of the writing of the Chronicle, so almost everything in it, is, it involves the Brahmins. You know, and, and it, anything else outside that, it just doesn't appear. But, and we're lucky that we know about that period because the Dutch were recording things, so we know, we know other things were going on. So it's very difficult to, 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 to generalize. You know. Sometimes it was rough and sometimes it wasn't. But the most interesting one is after 1688, but we can't tell really whether that was uh, because there was more revolt at this period, or whether just it wasn't recorded so well earlier. But the, you know, the, the city almost was taken by what amounted to a commoner revolt. It's a funny sort of question, what sort of percentage? percentage. Um, uh, there are, um, you see there's, what has been very good over the last few years is the amount of different material that has become available. So for a long time, historians were very dependent on the chronicles 
because there wasn't much else. But partly because we have much more, particularly Dutch and French and Portuguese, is, is now available. It's been published, often been translated, wasn't been there before. On top of that, quite a lot of Thai sources, which are not chronicles, which are other forms, have been found um, and have been reinterpreted. So we have a better idea of, of what they are and what they, what they might mean. But on top of that, uh, what we have been doing on top of that is just spreading your net much wider. And so we make a lot of use of literature, uh, which Thai historians have tended to almost ignore. And it, it's, it's difficult because very often these things are very difficult to date. You know, we don't really know when they come from and we certainly don't know who, who wrote them. So it's a bit dodgy. You have to make certain uh, decisions about them. We've made much more use of the law codes going, going back. But again, difficult because of, of dating. So you have to be a, a little bit careful in the way you, you used it. We've gone and looked at all, uh, I think, just about every Ayutthaya era mural that you can see, still see. And they say, and we go and look at And they're fascinating. There's a lot of social detail. And fascinating to see what you think they were, were trying to do. So, um, and we go and walk around the old cities, you know. And put, get your, you know, the sort of dirty boots idea. And, um, and this, is, this is very important. It's not just about uh, the, the quantity of written sources. It's about using other kinds of things. Now, I remember distinctly, and this is a long time ago now, I'd been reading the old history of Ayutthaya, which is you know, absolutely f simply focused on Ayutthaya, and it says it conquered the Sukhothai kingdom and everywhere else very quickly after 1351. And I remember sight bicycling around the ruins of Kampeng Pet. And you realize there's this enormous place. It's, it's, it's spread out enormously, and it's full of uh, what is clearly little village hamlets with ruins of, uh, of little what and so on. And then there's this center which is completely designed on a royal scale. And you realize, you know, this idea that th these places have been wiped out and became vassal kingdoms and rubbish. These are very important, important places. So it's not just about quantity of written sources. Other way. Well, you mentioned law codes. Could you uh, expound on that a little bit? Uh, were there yeah. many or yeah. one continuous okay. or? So in, in the first reign, in just after 18, uh, 1800, King Rama I had them collect together all the legal documents they could find. And he had them put into this single edition called the, the Three Seals Code. And, th and unfortunately, uh, they then destroyed <laughs> everything else. So, uh, but, so that's, what, that's what, we, what we have. And it's difficult to, it's, it's very extensive, and it shows you how important law, law is. It has a couple of very major difficulties. The first one is that the dates on many of these laws are clearly wrong. Right? They, they don't, don't make any sense at all. Um, and you can decode that somewhat by looking at other parts of the law to work out what dates they come from. More difficult is the fact that the way law was made, that when the king gave a ruling, in the king, you know, that was then written down and that became the law. So it was cumulative. So even if there's a law code and it has a date on it, it, it could have been accumulated after. So it's very difficult to, to date this stuff. So I'm, uh, it, it, I, the early stuff used very, very lightly indeed, just because nervous about the dating. But from the 17th century, it's well dated and it's very voluminous uh, and it's great. It's really quite something. It's, yeah, terrific. Again? <laughs> Come on. Um, actually, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. But I don't think so. But I don't think the Malay kingdoms that period were particularly important to IUTS. Not that much interaction at this period. Okay. I don't think until uh, the wars of, of Daksin and Rama I that then I think you start to get much more close interaction there. <laughs>
In, in, in the sort of Narai era, there's very little, you know. I mean, just a little bit of, little bit, the stuff with Patani, but not, nothing much else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is he famous for? You know, I, I, King Narai is very interesting because uh, his, his, uh, the image he has in uh, Western scholarship is sort of enormous because the, all the French uh, came at that era and the French were so uh, dazzled by Siam. Every single one of them went home and wrote a book about it. But you think, uh, if you look the other way around, uh, and so this gives this enormous impression of how important this French era was in the history of Siam. It's actually about 10 or 15 years. You know, they come, bang, and they go. And they leave almost nothing behind. You know? But conversely, you see, so they have this, built, this picture of Narai that's built up in, 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 in this view from outside makes him into this, this very worldly and modern and uh, you know, technically savvy king and all this stuff. But, so, but when looked at from things locally, uh, particularly from this stuff that is written shortly afterwards in the 18th century, which I take to be a kind of noble uh, oral history written by the Thai nobility, Narai is kind of, he's hardly there, you know. Yeah? Um, he, he, and, uh, it's, I think, all his kind of eclat, you know, which, is, which appears in the foreign stuff, um, I don't think it impressed the local population uh, very much indeed. And there's certainly this very large element in which the explosion of, of 1688 was fermented, or fermented long words, it, it had a large element of the Buddhist monkhood being extremely worried about Narai's relationship with the French and with the, with the, um, with the clerics. So there's a sort of, there's an element of Buddhism and danger uh, in that event, quite a big, a big element of, of that. And it's from this era you, you get appearing in, in the Wat murals uh, first, I, I think, in the early 18th century, these, these figures, which are very clearly frock-coated Frenchmen, who appear in Mara's army, you know, trying to destroy the Buddha when he's making a, you know, sitting under the Bodhi tree. So, and this, I think this is fa fascinating. I think this was, comes from this period when there's fears about the French and their, their pot potential threat to, to Buddhism. Do you have any conjecture why the Burmese destroyed the city rather than annexing the city and the territory around it? Well, as I said, and I don't think uh, you, you find no, uh, the, uh, no successful attempts to control uh, captured territory at any distance at all. So I, and, uh, you think in, in the previous act, in 1569, the Burmese had allied with Pizzanulo, with the, uh, I think there was a sort of strategy there. They thought they could have some control through some kind of uh, dependent king. It didn't work at all. I mean, uh, the, instead, the Pizzanulo dynasty took over in Ayutthaya, and, and they, they got rid of the Burmese as well. So there's no, there's no kind of framework for, for uh, imposing control at any kind of distance at this period. Um, it's, very, I think, very much a period still in which the basic unit is a city-state and then a, a, into sort of coalitions of, of, of city-states. Um, so uh, it just wasn't, wasn't on the cards. There was no thought that you would want to control Ayutthaya uh, in the same way, you know, that Britain wants to control Normandy, you know, Germany wants to control Alsace or anything like that. It's just not part of the political culture. You're, you, fight, you don't fight wars to control territory. You fight wars in order to get resources. Well, 
I think we are very lucky to sit through what a one and a half hour of Chris lecture. And I don't think if you rush back tonight and try to read the whole thing, uh, those who are lucky to bought the book at a thousand baht each, probably send you to sleep, you know? Because I think it's a very diffuse story, diffuse history of Vitutia, which uh, many of you, I'm sure, uh, would never think of it, you know? And, uh, but that's, that's what uh, it really is. And by putting it in a, a different plane, a different context, in fact, it's a very multinational context, you know? There are more actors. So, so uh, it's easier for us to, to understand what you're trying to say, I think, more than go and read it. I think it's very you know, quickly, point to point, the climax to falls and so on. So it's a very uh, exciting story. Um, and I think in a way it's more nationalistic than you think. You know, now Ayutthaya has become a major power in Asia, or maybe in the world. And I don't think Thais ever thought of it in that way, you know, from the, especially in the 16th century, for instance. So maybe you'll be remembered as a nationalistic Thai historian, <laughs> which is, uh, well, maybe that's what you intended, I think. But, but anyway, I have seen, uh, I have uh, read some accounts of the uh, contacts between Korea, you know, the wars in between Korea and Japan. And in fact, there was an uh, offer from the Chinese to send Siamese elephant to help the Koreans, you know. So uh, that's uh, something you don't realize if you don't read more. So I think uh, you have, we have to thank you for bringing all these actors together. But I think it's not easy to, to connect them all in, in, a, in a short time. But you've done quite well tonight. Thank, thank you. you. I can't stop it. Someone else has to stop it. <laughs> I, I think we should uh, declare the proceedings over. So thank you ever so much for coming, all of you. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>